I welcome everybody to the January 2024 meeting of the Parent Club. This is our 50th anniversary, and we're starting off this year with a speaker, excellent speaker from Ram Mobile Veterinary Clinic, Jasmine Raymond. Uh, Jasmine has been working in the veterinary profession since 2007, starting her career as an animal care technician, working primarily with exotic animals and then later with dogs and cats. In 2019, Jasmine partnered in the founding of Ram, where there's a strong emphasis on education, compassion, and client experience. She started the Bird Behavior Academy designed for bird owners who want to nurture a trusting bond, healthy environment, and a happy lifestyle for their birds. She's an avian fear-free certified professional and member of the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. She provides lectures on avian behavior and handling for Tufts University and a number of parent organizations. There are veterinary, these are veterinary approved programs that are tailored to training bird behavior through education. The goal of these programs is, is to provide you with all the necessary training tools for success and for you and your bird to have a healthy and flourishing means of communication that will foster a rewarding lifelong friendship. And she is currently vice president, hospital manager, and lead technician for RAM. And this fear free lecture will provide guidance on how to handle your bird and transport your bird in a stress free manner. We'll also go over signs of illness, what goes into an exam, and how to provide follow up care at home, including stress free administration of medications, proper at home hospital cage setup, safe handling, and so much more. So I'm going to turn it over to Jasmine now. We're very happy to have you with us and Jasmine Raymond. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here this evening. Um, this is a very fun lecture. It's one of my favorite ones to provide. Um, so there's a lot of information. I will try to be as efficient and thorough as possible and um, leave some time at the end for us to um, go over some things and uh, answer any questions that you might have at that time. So let's dive on in. So this is a lecture on avian fear-free veterinary care. And in this lecture, we're gonna kind of go over all of the basics and we're gonna start with um, our history and we're gonna lead into the actual uh, fear-free examinations and some things that we can do at home to um, prepare for these types of exams. So again, my name is Jasmine Raymond. Um, I've been a veterinary technician for a number of years, um, starting in laboratory medicine and moving over to general practice before we started up uh, RAM in 2019. Um, we primarily started um, as a mobile clinic providing at-home veterinary care. Um, we were definitely um, uh, affected by COVID, um, but we were also able to provide a lot of care during COVID where other hospitals were closed down. So that was huge for us and for pet owners, especially bird owners at home that really didn't have a lot of resources during that time. Um, and since then, we have built a practice in Pueblo, Massachusetts. So now we have a, an established veterinary clinic um, where we can provide even more extensive procedures and things of that nature um, just due to more resources. So that's just a kind of a little bit about us. I am a member of Birds of a Feather. I saw it right here. I'm a member of um, IVAC, um, and I'm also uh, a member of AAV and, of course, a Fear Free uh, Certified Professional. So these are our mobile vehicles. Um, this is just kind of an idea of what to expect when we do come to your home. These are fully, fully equipped mobile vehicles, uh, 26 feet. Um, they are fully equipped with heat, um, air conditioning. We have a surgical suite and we also have a dental suite um, and an examination area. So we can really provide a full scope of veterinary care right in the convenience of your driveway. Um, a lot of people ask, what does RAM mean? RAM is a um, is basically just a breakdown of the type of animals that we see. So we see reptiles, of course, avian, um, aquatic animals. Dr. Rob is uh, boarded in aquatics. And we also see mammals, um, of course, cats, dogs, um, all the above. And uh, we, we service a lot of different zoos. Zoo medicine is definitely one of the big things um, that has uh, been huge for us, especially being mobile, because we can bring the clinic to the actual zoo versus them having to bring the animal into the clinic, which is huge. So this is kind of just a little bit of an overview of what to expect. So I always like to go into the history of parrots in general. I have developed a very strong passion for parrots and their behavior. I think they're extraordinary animals. Um, and I think that through better understanding, we can provide happier and healthier lifestyles for them. So there are over 300 and different, uh, 350 different species 
around the world. Of course, that number is increasing tremendously as breeders are making hybrids of different types of birds. So um, that number changes almost yearly, um, just based off of the different types of birds that are being bred with one another. Um, they typically originate from tropical and subtropical areas. So um, Africa, South America, Australia, Central America, South Asia, um, they typically travel in large, large flocks, as you can see in some of these pictures. And when they're not in flocks and they're by themselves, they typically um, go to the highest point in nature um, so that they can kind of see everything that's going on below them. They are not birds. Uh, birds are not um, animals that like to stay low on the ground unless they are foraging, looking for food and things of that nature. Uh, otherwise, they are high up in trees um, above, uh, you know, above everything to stay away from danger and anything that could be uh, a potential threat to them. <clears throat> so when you look at the bird from the outside, looking in, um, this is kind of just a breakdown of the anatomy. Starting from our forehead, um, you have our nares, which are the little tiny little nostril noses that you see. Sometimes there are species of birds that will have them covered, so it's a little bit difficult to see them, um, but they're there. Um, their beaks, their cheeks, their chins, throats, um, right underneath and to the sides of their throat is where their crop sits. So when, uh, you know, when they're eating and all of that, and you see that little puffiness right around that area, that's because their crop is filling with food that will then be digested into, uh, into the abdomen. Um, and then you have your shoulders, breast, abdomen, your feet, your toes, your thighs, um, and then we get into the feather areas. Um, so they have primary feathers, they have secondary, and then they have wing coverts. Um, and then they have the nape of the neck, ear coverts, and eye rings. So these are all things that we are looking at during a physical exam. Because these are all very, very important aspects to their overall health. Um, typically, when a bird is not feeling good, something here um, if not inside, something on the outside, is there's something wrong. And that's, you know, these are the top things that we look at um, from the outside during the veterinary exam. Once we get inside into the respiratory system, um, most birds have nine air sacs um, and they basically just kind of work their way down. So this is a crucial piece of information, especially when we're dealing with any type of respiratory symptoms. Um, this is why it is extremely dangerous to have Teflon plant, uh, pans, um, any type of aerosols, candles, or anything of that nature that could potentially cause harm to these, to these guys. And that's because of the fact that they have multiple air sacs. So when something goes through their system, it's actually filtering through each and every single one of these air sacs, which means that if bacteria is introduced to that, it can kind of sit into those air sacs and just build more and more bacteria, um, which can cause more and more infection, which, you know, overall causes illness. Um, and this is one of the main reasons why their respiratory system is so important in keeping them away from those toxins that could potentially, um, you know, cause harm down the line. So it's important to really understand a bird inside and out in order to really be able to provide a full scope of care for them. Um, one of the most important things when you're dealing with behavior and you're dealing with illness is posture and body language. They are going to tell us mostly everything that we need to know um, based off of their posture and their body language. In fact, critically ill patients that come into the clinic a lot of times do not even receive, at our clinic anyways, they do not receive a physical exam until they're well enough to be able to be handled. So a lot of our exam is based off of a visual, um, seeing how they are laying. Are they are they low on their keel? Is their beak down? Um, are they tail bobbing? Is there, you know, is there any type of motion in the eyes that could indicate some sort of illness or things of that nature? So um, the, because they're so delicate, we avoid um, aggressive handling or any type of excessive handling, especially when they are critically ill, we want to try to work them up to get to a point where we are able to handle them without injuring them. So um, this also plays a huge part into their behavior, because a lot of times there are uh, some owners might not know the difference between hormonal behavior and actual sick behaviors. So uh, the rule of thumb is, um, we can pet our bird's head around our beak, our feet, um, our little cute cheeks, those are all okay areas. Everything else basically is making your, boar or your bird hormonally frustrated. Um, and this is because they do not know. They basically have a mentality. Um, studies have shown that some birds have a mentality of a six-year-old 
um, basically their entire life. So imagine 30 years of a six year old um, and having to, to deal with that. It can be it can be challenging at some time. Um, so anything that we can do as owners, as humans in this situation to make sure that we do not um, drive them in a, in a hormonal state of mind is going to be crucial to their overall health because hormonal behavior could inevitably lead to sick type of behaviors um, if it becomes too excessive. So um, I know that it seems like, you know, you want to pet your bird, you want to love your bird, but in, in fact, you might be doing more harm than good if you're touching inappropriately. So let's go over some normal type of behaviors that we're that we see with them. One of the biggest thing are calls that we typically get is my 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 bird is um, grinding its beak. What's going on with it? Typically, this is a sign of comfort. A lot of people will notice this type of um, sound or um, gesture as they're getting ready to go to bed, um, as they're you know laying in your in, in your lap or you know kind of just cuddling out with you. It's just a, it's usually just a sign of comfort if it's something that's happening happening excessively throughout the day um, for no reason whatsoever, then yeah, you should definitely talk to your veterinarian about it. But ideally, uh, typically, it's it's just, um, it's just comfort. Um, they're extremely smart. They're very inquisitive. So foraging and playing with different types of toys, anything that sparks their interest um, and keeps them busy throughout the day is normal behavior. Um, Chattering and vocalizing throughout the day is normal. Dancing, um, they're very curious and they are very clean creatures as well. So preening and bathing are all very, very normal types of behavior. So as we get into the abnormal behavior, we may notice things like regurgitation, which um, a lot of people will just say, my bird's vomiting on you, on me. Um, and basically what they're doing is like we talked about that crop that sits there on the side of their throat. They're taking all that food and they're bringing it back up and they're showing you, look at how much I love you. I'm throwing up all my food on you so you can see how much I care. Um, it's typically a sign of uh, a hormonal type of response. However, regurgitation could also be a sign of an underlying condition. Um, and it's always important whenever you notice any type of regurgitation to notify your veterinarian as soon as possible. Feather, feather destructive behavior, again, you triple the line of hormonal versus actual illness. So it's very important to monitor when that's happening. Is it a seasonal thing that my bird likes to rip out all their feather chest, uh, you know, their, their, their chest feathers? Or is it every single day, all day? Um, there's a big difference in that. Biting and aggression, screaming, charging, um, certainly sitting at the bottom of our cage, um, tail bobbing excessively, perching very low. These are all abnormal behaviors that you should at least just call someone and have a conversation with the vet and see if it's something that's worth bringing them in for. So again, when you're talking about behaviors, whether they're sick or, hom or hormonal, they kind of go hand in hand with one another. If you look at any one of these boxes, you could technically you could technically track it back to a hormonal behavior, but it can also track to a very sick behavior. So it's important for you to understand and know your bird in order for you to be able to speak on their behalf to the veterinary team and for us to understand and know your bird because I, you know, we see them maybe once or twice a year for healthy exams, you know, annual blood work. However, you see them every single day. So nobody is going to know better than you if this is a hormonal type of event or if this is something is wrong and we need to um, gather some um, some more resources and get some attention for the bird. Um, certainly, if you're seeing any type of prolapses in birds, which basically is when their vent kind of looks like it just became inside out and there's organs coming out of it, that that could be a hormonal um, type of behavior. But it, it very quickly turns into a it needs to go to the vet right away when that happens because um, that is something that is very time sensitive that we need to address right 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 away. Um, okay, so. Fear Free. What is Fear Free? So Fear Free is a program uh, tailored for pet owners, um, but also for veterinary professionals, and it works to prevent and alleviate fear, anxiety, and stress in pets by inspiring and educating the people who care for them the most, you um, and us, the veterinary team, in order for us to be able to provide overall care for them. Um, stress is a condition that can exacerbate diseases, and it could lead to severe illness or death. Um, I have... I can't tell you how many times I've heard clients say to me, well, I brought my bird one time to get a blood draw and then they just died. Um, so I don't want to do blood work on my birds anymore because blood work kills the birds. It's not necessarily the blood work gathering that kills the birds um, or that injures the birds. Because if you're going to a reputable source, to a reputable veterinary 
um, clinic that deals specifically with avian patients, they should be trained in order to be able to gather a blood sample. It's the stress that really gets to them and it gets to their little hearts, the stress between capturing them in the home, putting them in a carrier, bringing them to the veterinary clinic, an unknown space with unknown humans grabbing me and then trying to draw blood for me. All those things build up um, and that's ultimately what leads to severe illness or death in these type of situations. So today we're gonna to talk about how we can avoid um, or at least try to minimize um, a lot of that stress. Um, so veterinary, uh, fear free uh, for the veterinary professionals, there are several certifications, there are several levels. Currently, um, I am a certified veterinary uh, fear free professional. I, have, I also um, did the avian professional certification the critical care and the um, euthanasia certification um, as well, because it really does play a huge factor into what we do every single day. And it has changed the way that we um, treat animals and it really has changed the way that we, our, our whole approach to um, exams, especially with avian patients. So when we talk about um, fear free, the biggest scale that we have to go based off of is called an FAS scale. And what that scale is means fear, anxiety, and stress. And we break it down between three levels. Level one um, is a relaxed, fur, calm, soft eyes, uh, expression, very interested, maybe has a little bit of a slight open beak um, just, just because of curiosity. Um, very, you know, eyes wide open, we're not pinning, you know, um, and our feathers are nice and slicked back and we are, we're okay, we're, 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 we're enjoying ourselves. Um, as we go up to a level two to three, um, this is a very uh, anxious bird. We're leaving, we're walking away from the veterinary team, we're pinning because we're so unsure of who's in front of us and what they want from me and what are they gonna do to me? Are they gonna grab me type of scenario? Um, that leads to increased respiratory rate. So now we're, you know, now we're stressed and we're pinning and we're, you know, we're kind of pouncing all around and, and we're, we're, our respiratory rate is going up and we're vocalizing. And, and ultimately that leads, that leads to an attempt to launch at the veterinary team or anyone at that point, it could even be the owners depending on how the situation is going, um, that that they could attempt, you know, kind of turn on and not because um, they're, they, they mean harm, it's just because they're extremely scared. Um, level four to five is full blown lunging, we're biting, we're rolling onto our back, we are not letting anyone touch us, everyone's against us, we're in panic mode, um, in particular with African Grays, for those who own African Grays, they do have a, um, a stress response in which they will actually appear like they're bleeding from their eyes. It's a porphyrin that they release from their eyes and it is a very red color and it looks almost as if they're completely bleeding from their eyes. And if you do not know that, it can be quite, um, it can be quite traumatic. Um, but this is kind of like worst case scenario, level four to five at our clinic at this point in the exam, we would say we're done for the day. This isn't gonna happen. We need to give it a break and we need to readdress this when we're less stressed out because ultimately this is just going to lead to um, just not, overall not a great exam. Um, so nobody wins at the end of that. So let's get into, and, and I hope that this will let me show these videos. Um, we're gonna get into kind of some of the things, uh, so this is Max, he's a cockatoo. We're gonna get into some of the things that people unfortunately have to experience when they're at home and it comes time to go to the vet because it almost, always seems like the birds know no matter what they always know that something is happening as soon as that carrier comes out so i'm sure that a lot of you can probably relate to this scenario all they did is set it on the floor that's all i did it's not even your normal carrier. That used to be angry. So in this video, you can see Max is clearly not impressed with this carrier. He wants nothing to do with it. He wants nothing to do with going to the vet. Um, this is definitely something that he has experienced before. And he knows, he knows the drill. He knows what's going to happen. So he is going to let you know all about it. He is frustrated. He is already at this point, um, and we have not even reached the car, we're already at a level two when it comes to our FAS scale. Um, so, you know, and, and again, we haven't even reached the car. So this is a huge deal when it comes to 
you know, taking your, your parrot to the vet, what, what all does that entail, like from start to finish? Um, and that's why it's very important for us to, to know um, how, to, how to deal with these situations. So now um, we've gotten up into the carrier, finally. Um, we don't know how long exactly that took, but Max is in the carrier and he is ready for his vet visit. Um, so now we have the car ride. And for some people, that car ride might be five minutes. And for others, um, a car ride to an avian vet might be 50 minutes. It might be an hour and change, um, which is a very long time for a bird to be in a carrier in a car. So this is Max. Once every couple months. So imagine that the entire ride <laughs> there to the vet and the entire ride back. But more importantly, imagine the stress that this poor guy is going through during this during this this ride. And um, you can hear the owner in the background say, "Well, it's only every few months." Um, so clearly Max has some things going on that he does need to see the vet frequently. So to have this be um, to have this be the response every single time is quite traumatic. And it definitely warrants some change in how we're approaching and how we're doing this, because this could be a much easier experience um, if we follow all of the proper channels in order to make this um, uh, an easier process. So with all that said, by the time they get to us, this is kind of, you know, after, you know, those events, this is kind of what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a very stressed out bird, um, which again, we now just got out of the car. We are in a new setting. We're in a, you know, in, in a, an exam room. I do not know these people. I might not necessarily recognize these people. Um, and we let them out of the carriers. And this is our automatically our defense um, mechanism. It's, you know, like, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Um, so, how do we as, um, as a veterinary professional team and as the parents of these guys, how do we change our approach? What can we do differently to make this process easier on both of ourselves, on the team, um, on our bird, on everyone who's involved in this? It's a combined effort and it's a combined effort between us as your veterinary team. Um, and what that means is experienced veterinary team that understands and knows birds, um, You whether you go to a boarded specialist or you have an avian vet and a veterinary team that you trust tremendously, it is important to know that the people who are caring for your bird know what they're doing and what they're talking about. Because owning a bird, um, it's actually a lifestyle change. It's a, it's a whole lifestyle in and of itself. It's not just a, hey, I feel like getting a dog. And, you know, that's, that's kind of that, not picking on dogs, but it's very different. These birds live upwards to 30, sometimes 50 years, I have owners who have their birds in their wills who have plans for them for when they pass away, what's going to happen with these birds. So it truly is a very big lifestyle change. Um, it takes a lot of time and effort. Um, you know, we, I, I know just personally, um, in our personal life, you know, there's certain times where we're like, nope, we can't, you know, go out super late tonight because we have to get home to the birds. You know, they have a schedule, they have an expectation that we're going to be home at a certain time, that they're going to eat at a certain time and lights off and all that at a certain time. So we have to make sure that we maintain that schedule for them. Um, it also takes a lot of patience and um, love. You have to love these guys in order to change your whole lifestyle and the way that you do things in order to accommodate and have them in your life. Um, it's very important to know when you are taking in a bird, whether you are adopting or rescuing or purchasing, that you have a veterinary team nearby, that you have a resource to be able to take these guys to in the event that they are sick. Because most of the time when parrots do get sick, it's it's not a matter of I have to get them It's it's uh, to the vet. It's like, how quickly can I get them to the vet? So having a, a good veterinary team around you is going to be very important. And of course, with that comes cost. Um, you know, veterinary care in general um, can be costly. And then add to that, you're now um, kind of narrowing down your scope of veterinary care to just one species. And, you know, there's specific, specific tests and things like that that are tailored to these guys. So those, all those things cost money. Um, so I always say there's no such thing as a bad bird. We're just untrained humans. We have to find ways to relate to them because these guys are used to being in the wild. They're used to living in flocks. They're used to foraging for food. They're busy. They have a job. They have things to do in the wild versus, 
you know, we've domesticated these guys, we've put them in cages. And, you know, as, as many of us who say, well, the cage is always open, they can always come out. Technically, they really can't, you know, it, they can't just open up the window and fly away. Um, so we have to really train them and also provide all of the proper tools that they need to be able to thrive in the environment that we have now placed them in. So the first step is to set goals and not unrealistic goals. We have to set very, very realistic goals and expectations. Um, and that applies for both your birds and yourself. So what your guys' patience level is going to be working with one another. Um, we have to stay consistent. We can't decide that we're gonna train one day and the next day we're just gonna be a little laxed on it. It has to be an every single day thing. Um, even though we minimize the length of our training sessions to about 10 to 15 minutes a day, because studies show that that's pretty much the attention span of a bird for um, strategic thinking, um, we still have to be consistent with that 10 to 15 minutes a day, whether we break it up to three times a day, or we do one 10 to 15 minute course once a day, stay consistent with whatever pattern you're on, um, and focus on the importance of what you're trying to overcome. So, you know, if you're just trying to get your bird to catch a ball versus we are trying to train our bird to be able to step onto a dowel to be able to get into a carrier so that we can safely transfer them to the vet. Those are very different things. So just knowing what your expectations are out of this is going to be huge when setting your goals. So the first, um, the first thing that I recommend anytime we're training for going to the vet um, is the desensitization process. So basically what that means is we're going to take all of the things that we would typically see at the vet or that would lead us to believe that we're going to the vet, such as the towels and the carriers. Um, we're going to take those things and we're going to make a game out of it. We are going to, you know, put foraging um, items in our carrier to make them more curious about getting into that carrier. We're going to let that carrier sit out all day, every single day, so that when it comes out that once a year, it's not going to be that big surprise. It's just going to be, okay, that's the carrier. It just got a little bit closer to me. Um, we are going to get very comfortable with blankets and towels and stepping up on us with towels and stepping off of us with towels. Um, and the way that we train those things is through positive reinforcement. So we're going to find things that our birds in, uh, enjoy, whether that's treats, um, praise, um, you know, little scratches on the head, whatever it is that they that they enjoy, um, we are going to use that when we are training them. So um, peekaboo snuggly time is a, a video that I found. Um, and this is kind of a very good example of desensitizing this parrot to um, towels. So this owner, uh, this parrot in particular, she was having some difficulties with her um, being able to, you know, get used to the toweling and, and handling for nail trims and wing trims. So she made a game out of this. And basically, it's a peekaboo game. So as you can see, the bird has absolutely no idea that this is a towel. She thinks that this is a game and she's having fun. And not only that, she's having a really good time bonding with her human. And that's super important to build trust in order for us to be able to do the things that, um, that we need to do with them. So desensitization is definitely the, the first, first step um, in preparation for our veterinary exams. If you have a carrier in the house, bring that carrier out, put it in front of our, our cage. We don't have to put it right in front of our cage. We can put it within the same room. We can put it within sight in a different room, but as long as the bird can constantly see it and know that it's not going to harm it, that's the first step in moving in the right direction. So um, when we are applying this uh, desensitization, our step one is to introduce the stimulus. So in this particular case, we're going to pick on the carrier. So we're going to introduce the carrier. Like I said, we're either going to put it within sight. It does not necessarily have to be in the same room, but within sight of your parrot. Um, and we are going to then step two as, you know, reward us with a treat. Hi, good carrier. Here's a treat. And we are going to talk about it constantly as we then start to move that carrier closer and closer to us while still offering treats in between those as a positive reinforcement, that's how we are going to slowly, and it might take weeks, it might take a couple of months. This is not something that's going to happen in a couple of hours. Remember, we have 10 to 15 minutes of attention span a day to be able to accomplish this. And if we are petrified of the carrier, that is going to take however long it's going to take. 
Um, but as long as we stay consistent in our training and consistent in our reinforcement, we should be in a good place to be able to accomplish this, this goal. So again, um, this the step two, the tree part, it can be replaced by um, praise. It can be replaced by love and affection and scratches, things like that. Um, so, so those are th th those are things that we can replace in this in this particular situation. Um, the next thing is toweling. So safe restraint um, in the veterinary clinic is super important for a number of reasons. Um, when we're performing grooming, we definitely want to make sure that um, we are toweled appropriately. Um, if a bird is flapping its wings, they, um, they definitely pose uh, a risk of injuring or breaking something. Same thing with our feet, um, if we're kind of kicking a lot. So having um, somebody properly restraining for that is huge. Um, occasional uh, emergencies at home. I'm sure that a lot of people have experienced kind of like a little broken blood feather. Um, it is very important to be able to um, towel our bird at that time and assess the situation and, you know, try to get it under control as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. Um, and of course, for veterinary procedures such as blood draws, um, x-rays, um, or, you know, administering medications, fluids, injections, things of that nature, it is very important to have safe towel restraint in order to do that. Um, so it doesn't have to be a scary thing with proper social, uh, socialization and training. Um, birds can become very tolerant of toweling and the process of, especially if we make it into a game, it can become, it can be quite fun. Towel training is super important. Um, again, anything that we can uh, remove uh, uh, as far as associating any type of behavior with our hands, um, especially if it's going to be something that they do not particularly appreciate, um, you know, as of going into the carrier, probably not something that we want to uh, do with our hands because we like our fingers and we definitely do not want to get to a point um, where we're injuring um, ourselves or the bird. Um, target training is very important. I, um, I believe that Sheila did a, a talk not that long ago about it, um, and it definitely is super helpful, helpful for us for uh, medication administration, and that's definitely something we can dive more into at another um, lecture, but target training is definitely something that we recommend at home as far as um, training in order for us to be able to do more things with us inside of the clinic. So with that said, I'm going to show you a couple of fear-free uh, veterinary exams, um, and you can kind of see for yourself the difference as far as um, maybe what you have experienced in the past versus kind of what we have experienced through our training process. So this first one is Miss Layla. So as you can see, Layla um, allowed us to be able to do almost all of our exam other than the diagnostics with out any toweling or restraint whatsoever. She was in the hospital with us for um, a couple of weeks, so we did get a lot of training done during that time, but it just kind of goes to show you that it can be done um, even in, you know, in small um, increments of time as long as we stay consistent. This next one is Smokey. All right, I am not going to your exams. Good boy. Good boy. <laughs> so good. You're being so good, boy. I saw. So Smokey's in control of the exam. You feel like he's getting stressed. We back off. Good boy. Can I see the other side? No, we only get to see one side. <laughs> turn this way. Okay. What if good you turn boy. this way? Touch, good, good boy. boy. Touch, good boy. Touch, good boy. 
So again, a lot of target training, which is what led to this, which is why we were able to accomplish as much as we did with Smokey, because he is very well trained, um, and which is why his beak was constantly touching um, the otoscope here, because he knows uh, through his training that if he does that, he's going to get a treat or he's going to get praise or whatever the case may be. Um, this next baby is Milo, who I have been grooming for a very, very, very long time. And Milo and I have an understanding. Milo does not like towels. And I promised him that we would no longer need to use towels if he would just cooperate with his grooming process. Um, so through training, we were able to accomplish that. Good boy, Milo. Good boy. Wow. So Milo's gotten to the point where he just sticks his toes out. He lets me do what I have to do. He gets a really great treat at the end. Zero toweling. I do not even have to take him out of his house. It's a win-win situation overall. So that is what a fear-free exam really should look like. Um, and um, and that's that's ultimately our goal. Our goal is to be, is to be able to provide the uh, amount of training that you would need in order for us to be able to um, have that type of experience without the the stress involved in it. So the Bird Behavior Academy was designed just for that. Um, I provide Zoom lectures and I provide one on one Zoom trainings for any type of parrot with any type of issue. Um, again, when it comes to like fetching a ball, I'm probably not the greatest at that type of training. But when it comes to, um, you know, trying to get us to behave and work with us, I can certainly, certainly help in that aspect. Um, so let's go into just a couple of stories very quickly and we'll wrap it up. Um, Pete's story. Pete is um, a Senegal parrot that my wife and I rescued in 2018. Uh, he was kind of just dumped at a clinic that I was working at at the time and they no longer wanted him. Um, at the time, he was extremely mangled. He had abrasions and lesions all over his face. He was constantly um, traumatized and just uh, he was in a very bad place space. Um, he looked terrible. His behavior was ex like a four to a five on average as far as an FAS scale, biting, lunging, just completely unhandleable at that, at that point in time. Um, fast forward 2023, he has been with us since. Um, he looks amazing. He is so calm and relaxed. He is dowel trained. He is target trained. Um, he is still working on full-blown veterinary exam training, but it, again, this is something that's going to take some time for this little guy. He's been through a lot of stuff um, for a 20-year-old bird, but this is him having uh, fun. And in this video, I will show you... Um, Right behind him, this little blue carrier right here, that is what I use to transport him. So this carrier is constantly within sight of his sleep cage, so he can constantly see this. There is never a time where he is not within eyesight of this carrier, so he knows this one very well. I love that he gets like so excited that he almost falls a little and then catches himself, <laughs> but he's having a really good time. He's really enjoying himself. That's one of his favorite songs. But I mean, as you can see now, we are able to handle him. He will come to us and, and hang out with us. He'll sit on our shoulders. He will let, um, he'll let my wife pretty much handle him um, and do pretty much most of anything that needs to be done. I think that he definitely associates uh, me more with the actual like um, handling and, and blood draws and stuff like that. Um, she is his person. So he's very bonded with her. And that works very well in our favor for training purposes. So as you can see, he's come quite a long way um, in the short time that we've had him. The next one is um, a client that I met um, from the Connecticut Parrot Society who was having uh, an issue with her bird, Luna, and getting Luna into the carrier. Um, Luna was a 10-year-old male, DNA confirmed. She's had him for about nine and a half years. Um, the time before that, he was with her son, so he's always been within the same household. Um, and he has a severe fear of the carrier and transport. He has a history of respiratory distress when dealing with the carrier. And mom had to cancel her last vacation and hadn't been on one in a good amount of time because he ended up at the ER when trying to put him into the carrier and transfer him to the vet. So she reached out to me asking for some help. So 
we started again with a history. What are, you know, what, you know, we have to learn more about these guys. They're, the Hyannis have a very gentle dis, uh, uh, disposition. Um, they have a reputation for being very quiet. Um, they're, um, they're very shy birds and they are very unique birds because they're actual response to external stressors is respiratory noise, noises that can be misinterpreted as like a sneezing or a wheezing or hyperventilation and things of that nature. Um, in this particular case, Luna was having way past just that stress response um, because he actually got himself so worked up to the point that he ended up needing to be at the ER and under oxygen. So we started with the desensitization process. Here is Luna in his, uh, in, you know, in his little castle. And right over here by the table, you can see that mom and I took the carrier apart and she actually placed the top of it over by him, uh, over uh, in front of his cage. And the other part, I don't know if you can see it right here, but it has a towel down on it and it's sitting next to his cage. So that's how we started. And we did about a week of that because we were in a little bit of a time crunch because she had this vacation plan. So um, as you can see here, Almond is inside of the bottom of the carrier, carriers within eyesight of Luna. So we're gonna make this a game. There's an almond, so here's the carrier. Oh, my goodness. And there's an almond on a towel. Yeah, a little bleach towel, which is great for birdies. And here's her play gym, and here's her cage. And the screws are out, and the top is off. And let's see how close Luna wants to get to that almond in the carrier, which is so good. Now you can go into the carrier for treats. So you can see here our tone, you know, we, we had to really make this a game. So everything is very in, in, in an exciting tone. The carrier, the carrier, we were just making a very big show out of all of it um, because it, it was just increasing our curiosity with Luna. Um, but again, with everything, you have to be very patient. So this was a couple of weeks after. When she came back from the vet, there's an almond in there for you. There's an almond in your carrier. Go get it. You see it? See the almond? Well, that was a very good interpretation of. So we attempt, but we're just not at that point yet. We're not ready. And that's okay. That's totally okay. Because as, as long as we stay consistent and we are patient, we will get the results that we ultimately need. So we start again from scratch. We take that carrier back apart and we make it a game again. And now it's become such a game that Luna thinks that she actually invented or he actually invented the game. Um, as you can see, he's extremely proud of himself. He's doing his birdie dance. He's, you know, standing on top of it. Um, and we have accomplished a step and we are staying on track. And at the end, we will celebrate as long as we stay on track. You just want some love. Is that all you want? A little reassurance? And just like that, mom was able to go on vacation. Luna was able to make it to the boarding facility without respiratory distress. Um, and we were now moved on to our next training process. And yes, it took us some time, but mom was very consistent. She was a crucial part in all of the success of this um, because this was a fully, fully uh, Zoom training session. Um, this, this owner lives in Connecticut. So we actually never really had the opportunity to meet other than our, um, our weekly Zoom sessions. And we were able to accomplish this together. So this was a very proud moment for both of us and for Luna, of course. Okay, so I know that was a lot of information. Does anyone have any questions? I was just yeah. saying, I give my patients, you know, which I've been doing for many, many years. I found that if I tell the bird, that's what they don't like. It's not the medication. If I let them just sit on the counter and walk up to the syringe, then then they're generally fine. So it, it's kind of interesting. People always assume it's the medication they don't like, but it's, they don't they like don't. being held and being, having medication forced on them. <laughs> Correct. Typically, uh, especially nowadays, um, the, the medications that 
that we provide for, for our avian patients are compounded medications. And typically they flavor them, you know, they make it a peanut flavor or peanut butter or something like that. So they make it very, very uh, enticing for them. So it, yes, you are absolutely correct. It's more the process of being mishandled or how they vision it as being mishandled that really bothers them rather than the actual medication intake itself. Uh, if anybody wants to go ahead, they can just go ahead and talk, or if you don't want to talk out loud, you can put a message in the chat and we'll do it out loud, but we'll open up the questions. I see Bonnie has a question. Yeah, I just want to, okay, we're good at this point with the um, echoing. Um, so, um, Jasmine, um, I am, me and my bird are involved in parrot kindergarten. We've learned uh, um tremendous amount in terms of like the ABCs and reinforcement and punishment, what have you. Um, I have a currently 113 gram cockatiel. Um, I do go to somebody who is board certified. That's at least who I try to go to. Um, he tends to um, make a racket um, for lack of a better word in terms of moving and so on and so forth. Um, I guess my question is, when he stops um, making a racket, is that basically at that point like a learned helplessness or is that a, okay, I'm just not going to fight you? Because I'd rather, um, he amazingly, um, um, I was very concerned with, um, him, my my telling him and handing him to the vet um, or him coming back to me after an exam because I didn't want to be associated with punishment. Um, but he seems to come right to me after being handled. So obviously I'm providing, I'm providing something to him. But I'm just interested in the whole like learned helplessness thing or if that's just, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna fight you anymore. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So I, I guess, it, so your question is, is that when he is, when, when he gets to a certain point, he stops making the racket and he kind of just goes silent on you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like, what it sounds like to me is, is that he might be entering a kind of like a, a, a state of mind where it's like, like you said, helplessness, but more so it might be a stress response that it's like, okay, I'm, I'm making a racket and I'm not getting a response that I want. So maybe if I do this, I'll get a response that I want. So it really is going to depend on how you're responding to that behavior at that time. Um, if you're giving him praise for being such a good boy, um, you're doing such a good job. In his mind, he might take that as, okay, maybe if I act like this all the time, I'll be a really good boy all the time and 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 things will be a lot easier going forward. So it's not it's not going to so much be um his his response, but more so your response during that time when he is acting differently. Okay. But yes, okay. it could be a state of helplessness. Okay, okay. Sorry. Jennifer, Jennifer, if you want mute yourself. You go ahead and ask. Your question. Great. Thank you. Um, Jasmine, so I, I was just curious. I'm, I'm fairly new to the area. I recently moved from Chicago and I had a, a challenge in finding appropriate vet uh, avian vet care in the area. So I, I do live in Western Massachusetts and I drive to, I pack all four of my birdies and I drive to Kensington Bird Animal Hospital in Berlin, Connecticut. So it's over an hour. So I've got four nervous birdies in my car a lot throughout the year. But I was just curious about RAM in your facility. I mean, do you take open appointments or, or how does it work for someone to um, hook up with your clinic? Great question. Thank you. So we um, so we typically just ask for uh, medical records to be sent over to us in order for us to be able to uh, create an account for you. Um, it's also very important for us to understand and learn any medical history that might be there um, and might be important going forward for future care. And then at that time, we set you up with an appointment. We send you estimates based on your location if you're looking for home visits versus in-clinic care visits. Um, and then we kind of typically try to set up routine annual exams right at the time of leaving at a, the, the exam with you the first time so that that way you have at least that yearly exam constantly booked um, in advance. And then if uh, things come up where, you know, it's a sick visit or something's going on and you're not able to bring them to us, 
we can typically get you in same week for traveling visits to Massachusetts area. Um, it, you know, it might involve some moving things around, but we we prioritize our avian and exotic agents, um, especially when they're not feeling well because of the lack of resources um, in our area. So we'd be happy to have you and your flock. Absolutely. Um, great. Thank you so much. And one last quick question. Do you, do you also offer or have any recommendations on emergency care. I was sharing with Amy earlier that I had a last minute emergency recently where I walked in, I, I found my Quaker, blood everywhere. Um, it was a blood feather, but you know, I, I had to drive him an hour and 10 minutes just to find a place, you know, just to bring him to a vet that I could get him in um, on an emergent basis. And I mean, like most pet parents, it's kind of like kids, right? Like when something bad happens, it's on the nights and weekends. I was really fortunate that this happened like on a Tuesday afternoon and I could get him to a vet. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and that's a great point. It is very, very difficult right now, um, right, for for avian emergency care. Um, I do know that Bolger and uh, they just recently closed their exotics department. Um, the doctor has returned. However, she is very, very, very part time. So um, Bolger is probably kind of not a great option right now. What I would recommend is Tufts um, and uh, Angel. Those would probably be the two places that would have a board of uh, specialist, uh, a board avian specialist or an exotic specialist during emergency hours that could get you in. Or at the very least, they should have a trained veterinary staff team that could bring you in, triage you, and um, you know at least get a stable until the veterinarian can come in um, later that evening or the next morning. You could always call us in the event of an emergency. Like you said, um, this just so happened to be a blood feather. We can definitely walk you through things if we're not able to get out to you right away. Um, but we can at least walk you through things and assist you in getting to the right location um, and to the fastest place as quickly as possible. But it's interesting that you do that, Jasmine, because a friend of mine who lives um, outside of Boston did have a veterinary emergency a few months back with one of her birds, and she tried to go to Tufts, and Tufts said, don't bring the bird there. Right. They, 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 staff, staff would handle a bird emergency, which which was news to me, because I thought I, I, they had bird, they, had, they did avian emergencies 24-7 at Tufts. They, I experienced I the same thing, Amy. They, they turned me away too away time, time, time when I call them. So, um, so uh, just a little bit of history on Tufts. So, Dr. Graham, who is the you know the bird lady um, at Tufts, the 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 boarded specialist there, she has kind of gone more in the direction of lecturing. Um, she provides a lot of lectures and training for veterinary professionals in the avian field. However, that has kind of removed her from the actual clinical um, portion of things, which is why it's difficult. That's not the first time that I've heard that Tufts has had to unfortunately turn people away because of that. Um, it's just kind of one of those things right now where it is very, very difficult to find veterinarians who are confident um, enough to work with these guys because it, it, it is a, it's, you know, it's, it's a big deal um, working with avian species. As you guys all know, you know, you, you have to know what you're doing um, and you really have to be prepared for these types of emergencies. So if Tufts is telling you that they do not have a team to be able to provide the scope of care that you're needing, um, I, I definitely appreciate their honesty because I would rather know that rather than to bring my bird into somewhere and 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 think that they're not in the proper hands. Um, so we do take emergencies. Um, unfortunately, we are not an emergency facility. And like Jennifer said, these things usually happen at nights, weekends, you know, of random hours of the day. Um, we can promise that we will always, you know, respond as quickly and efficiently as we can. And if we are open and we are in the clinic, we will definitely have people come on in and triage and stabilize. And if we need to ship to a specialty facility, we can definitely help facilitate that with our mobile unit. Yeah, the one place, and it's, of course, a very long drive for any of us, but um, the Animal Medical Center in New York City is 24-7 avian. That's the only one left, uh, left that I know of. I go to South Wilton Vet, which is uh, not too far from the New York border, uh, but in the southern part of Connecticut, and they used to do to 11 p.m. seven days a week, but they just don't have the staff to be able to cover a call. So, you know, they're at six, they're basically done now on uh, you know six days a week. Um, Dr. Lori Hess in Westchester might do an emergency, but I don't know if that's only um, if you're a patient or not. There's also Central Animal Vet in Wallingford, Connecticut that, um, 
they will do birds 24 seven, but they don't have an avian bed in nights or weekends. What she did was set up protocols for the people that it's a 24 seven vet place, emergency vet place. She set up protocols. So if say your bird needed oxygen or needed a broken wing wrapped or, you know, blood's pouring out, they, they have protocols to follow standard emergencies. If the bird is like, for example, just sick, um, they probably wouldn't be, you know, it's 11 o'clock at night, they're not going to be able to diagnose it. Um, but if you had, I think, more of a physical injury or if you just need to get the bird an oxygen or something, um, you could go there. Um, but other than that, the emergency places are uh, drying up. And Vine just wrote, AMC does not have an avian vet 24-7. All staff can treat avian and get avian fund day. Um, okay, but Lisa, they have they have people that are experienced at night, Bonnie. This is Melissa in in New York. I actually just had a recent experience with AMC in Manhattan, and I got turned away. Oh God. Um, I've I've had prior emergencies where I've gone to them and did get helpful treatment, but um, just this this past month, I got turned away there and. Um, I actually used to go to the clinic in Bedford Hills where, um, it's Dr. Hess, Dr. Hess. Yes. And it sounds like she's not seeing, she herself is not seeing many patients and they weren't, they weren't willing when I called to, to do a, a telemed type appointment, um, because because my bird hadn't been there since before 2020. Yeah, Bonnie. Yeah, just, Bonnie just Red Bank. Red Bank. Um, that's uh, Red Bank, New Jersey. I think Bonnie exit 109 off the Parkway is 24 seven. I've heard that before. So I think right now they have. So they'll do emergency vets. That that's going to be obviously a huge haul for for most of us. But that's again important to know because of you know my bird that passed recently got really sick for Thanksgiving. He got in, we got into the vet the next day, but then he really deteriorated Christmas and before I could get back in, he, he died. So they they have a tendency to get sick on holidays and weekends or at night. And this is, this is a huge problem for all of us in the bird world to just not have emergency care available. And if, if Tufts and AMC can't help us, then I don't know what to do. If, if I go to my vet, they have a big sign on the door that says they after hours, go to AMC and, and Tufts. So, um, um, yeah, it's unfortunate. There is quite a shortage, um, kind of same deal with Dr. Hess. She's absolutely amazing. She does a wonderful job, um, but she has gotten to a point where she's kind of breaching, um, you know, the years of retirement and she's doing more lecturing and training for the next generation to kind of hopefully come in and take over where they're, where they're leaving off. Um, we do provide telemedicine consults over the phone. Um, I, you know, it, it's definitely, helpful. It's not as helpful as seeing them right in front of your face, of course. Um, but if you're willing to take the drive to Pepperell, if you're, you know, of course, if we're in the area of Massachusetts, or we can even meet you on the border, um, we, we we certainly will do the best that we can. But if you are willing to take that drive down to us in Pepperell, um, we can accommodate any situation. Um, you know, we do have all of the tools to be able to do that. We have a very, very well-trained staff uh, and team. Um, we have all been through this fear-free process and training protocols. So um, we are very prepared to, to handle that. I have explored the options and um, the processes of getting licensed in Connecticut. Um, so we are hoping that that will be coming um, soon down, you know, down, down the line. Um, However, that, you know, that's great for annual exams and things of that nature when it's a planned visit, like, hey, guys, we're going to be out here on this date um, versus, you know, like you said, something kind of happening in the middle of the night. But if you are willing to travel to us um, in Pepper, Massachusetts, we are willing to take on any type of emergency situation and we are accepting new clients. Currently, we are traveling um, about an hour and a half radius from our hospital to Massachusetts and New Hampshire. We are licensed in both states. Um, we are still licensed in Rhode Island. Um, however, we just, you know, we see more small mammal and exotics in Rhode Island rather than birds. Um, but we are licensed in that area as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. It's a, the it's a, the area you get licensed in, the fewer visits you probably have time for, um, unless you can you're taking on more more vets or uh, tech, techs there. Um, 
But just to clarify, so you would be able to do an emergency visit if someone drove to Petro? If yes, if if we're if you're willing to take the drive and come to us, we will absolutely take you know as long as we are in the clinic and we have the staff to be able to provide the proper care, we absolutely can do that. That's not a problem at all. And like I said, our team is very well trained, um, it, at least to be able to triage and stabilize something until you know myself or Dr. Rod can get in and really assess the situation. So we're all very well trained in that aspect. So yeah, if you're if you, if you can get it down there, we can definitely take you in. Yeah, well, yeah. we'll put your information in the chat and send it out to people because, you know, as, as you can hear from all the comments, we, you know, this is a tremendous need. And it, it, it's weird because Connecticut has a lot of avian vets now. I mean, more than a lot of places, but yet we still can't get after hours care. And, uh, you know, I was just chatting with, with uh, Jennifer earlier today that Jennifer was, I think it was Jennifer that, um, where she lived, you know, she was able to get 24 seven care and she's moved to this area now and is kind of plummets by the lack of 24 seven care. And we are too. And 10 years ago, there was more 27, 24 seven care for birds here than there is now, which is going in the, in the wrong direction. And it will be nice to figure out how to, how to turn this around. I think the big thing is nobody wants to do call. Um, which, which, which is understandable. Nobody wants to. No one wants to be on call nights and weekends. We cannot. It, it would be. It would be not. Amy. 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 Yeah. Um, I go to the Rye Harrison vet, and they. You can call them after hours. They always have a vet on call, and two of the vets are um, board certified for aviation. And um, will they see somebody who's not their patient though? You know, I don't know, okay? You know, and I haven't experienced an emergency with, with Peach, thankfully. Um, but, you know, it's worth checking out. Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. Um, uh, John Pashada is really, I, I think he's a very good. Um, yeah. So, Barbara, can you put that in? Jasmine, if you put your information in the chat, and Barbara, if you can put that information in the yes. chat. Uh, if everybody can put this in the chat, I can also distribute that to people, but. Um, sure. A lot of vets aren't going to see you even on an emergency basis if you're not a patient. Um, but it would be nice to know who who might even because. Well, when you go onto the website, you know it talks about all sorts of stuff. So you really need. And when you call them, they're very helpful. Um, and they're you know and. And it takes a while to get an appointment for a regular appointment. But like I said, I haven't had an experience where I needed somebody instantly. Okay. Um, I didn't have, I haven't had an emergency. We try to avoid that, especially on the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard emergencies seem to only be on the holidays. So. Right. Uh, no, it's my, it's my, it's my brother law right now that's on all the holidays. Uh, Val's had her hand up for a really long time, so I, I didn't want to forget you, Val, there. That's totally fine. Um, Jasmine, you know at least two of my four, um, in addition to all the other animals. I have one conure who genuinely does not want me to exist, um, and the, all of mine are rescues. All four of my birds are rescues. Um, but Emma the Conyer just only, he, he will fly to my husband, but he is like a four or five on that scale just for me getting near his cage some of the time. Sometimes he's calm, but a lot of the time he lunges and he bites. And um, I don't even attempt to handle him because I don't like, he just, uh -huh. he doesn't like it. He doesn't like me. It's like, no, it's just not a thing. But I do worry because um, of the two Conyers, I know he's a little bit older and I do know like at some point he should have a vet visit. Um, but I've hesitated because of that temperament. If, if they're at a four or five, even in the home, like, do you think there's hope for us, for us to do some sessions? sessions? 
Absolutely. I absolutely think that there's definitely hope. Um, and Conyers typically, in general, they tend to um, pick one person. So that's not unusual. Um, we are going to have to sacrifice and utilize your husband to our advantage when we're doing any of these exams and handling and training, um, because he is going to be our biggest uh our biggest tool to be able to have this bird be able to communicate effectively with you and with us during the exam. So it, it's good that he at least has that bond and that relationship with one of you guys, because that's going to be our entry to our training for sure. For sure. We'll see. He's, he's, He's not perfect, I would say, with Sam, but that's who he picks to fly to if he comes out. So okay. he's, uh, he's uh, yeah. I, I bet you he'll like you a lot more once he meets us. <laughs> he's going to want to walk right back over to you because, he, you know, it, it's always that, you know, they, they really do not want us to handle them much. Um, but yeah, let's let's try Next time we're there, let's try to just do some introduction, just like some hellos. We don't necessarily have to do the exam that same day, but maybe if we can at least kind of do a little bit of slow introductions with us. Us, um, that might be helpful for us going forward. Awesome. That would be great. Cause I do, I, I, Polly, I can make it work. Jem, I can make it work. And like that uh, mango, I could probably make it work. Emma might kill me. So good. That's a, we'll just have you come in and say hi. And say see hi. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll come in next time. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah, we'll take a peek around. <laughs> no problem. I also want to say, by the way, having a mobile vet would be, if, if you get licensed connected, I think you would uh, certainly get some business mm -hmm. here. We, we technically do have a mobile vet, whose name I won't mention, um, who was very useful for going to people's houses, but she didn't have, first of all, she didn't have her own hospital. So if the bird got sick, it wasn't a good situation in terms of the bird going someplace where the staff would know the bird and all that. Uh, on the other hand, the problem was she got very busy with other things in her life, so um, it became more and more difficult for people to get her. But we have a lot of people who have flocks of birds, and uh, particularly for well bird visits, it's obviously uh, much easier if the vet can go to the person's house and just do well bird visits on there than trying to get everybody in carriers or doing them multiple visits to get every get the well bird checks and all that sort of thing. So. There is a tremendous need for um, uh, a mobile vet here in Connecticut who, who can go out to everybody. And uh, we obviously have a lot of people. We have two parish clubs here in Connecticut and we have, we have a lot of people that uh, are wanting more vets, particularly a mobile vet that can come to their home. So. Yeah, we've definitely taken that um, into consideration um, just, you know, with working with the Connecticut Parrot Society and the, you know, the amounts of calls that we've gotten just from working with them. And now with, you know, hearing what you guys are saying. Um, yeah, we definitely want to be able to help in any way that we can. Um, we, again, our, we do provide the full, full mobile service um, because there, you know, there is a big difference between an in-home vet and, a, you know, and, and the veterinary clinic actually coming to your house in the event that that well bird visit turns into a stress induced type of visit. We're able to kind of just get us right back into our mobile clinic and provide oxygen and things of that nature. So um, we would come fully prepared for, um, for most any type of situation or outcome. But um, I will definitely keep you posted on our time frame as far as what it's looking like at gathering all of the information that we need um, to be able to get licensed. It is a process. Um, so I will I will certainly keep you guys posted. And again, if they're if you're able to make the drive, if you're in our area, if you're within our service ranges, we would be happy to take on any new avian clients um, and patients, anyone. Okay, fantastic. I'm just trying to see different. Um, we need to post your information in chat. I see Barbara's posted the Rye Harrison bed, and it's very easy to get to. It's right off 95, right over the line. Wait a minute, I saw something. Oh, yeah. Uh, we have a posting here for um, an avian, emergency avian bed in Great Neck, New York, open till 9 p.m. most weekdays and weekend hours, emergency phone number to night. So that's kind of like what my vet used to do. Um, that's in the chat too. Um, I mean, I can probably speak for most people and say, you know, if it's a true avian emergency, I, I don't care how far I have to drive. I'm not gonna say, no, I'm gonna let my bird die because it's an hour and a half, two hour drive. So um, 
I'm going to compile all this information that's in the chat and send it to everybody. Um, I think I probably know everyone that's registered or uh, whoever is read, whoever um, was here. I probably have I probably have their information or at least the group. So I can I can just send out to people that obviously I know there's some people here from other parts of the country who, who aren't going to be interested. But um, I'm going to send this information out because you can never have enough information about who could see a bird if it's an emergency. So, um, I'll, And feel free to visit our website and fill out that contact form with all of your information and your pet's information. Um, it's just easier for us to be able to locate you in the event that an emergency does pop up and you need to come in. Um, if everything is kind of already set up and ready to go and we have all the information that we need, it just makes it a lot easier for us to be able to do that intake. Um, it, it takes about five minutes tops. Um, it's right on our contact page on our website and you can just fill all the prompts there and it will come directly to, to our front desk team. Jasmine, would you like to put your website? Jasmine, how far are you from the Connecticut line? I don't know where you're located. Um, we're probably, I want to say, about two hours, I would say, give or take. Um, we're in Massachusetts. We're um, we're about 35 minutes away from probably, like Lowell would probably be one of the bigger places that you might recognize in our area, Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, so we're probably about two hours, I would say. Okay. Yes. And um, I did see that quite a few of our um, our clients put our website in um, in the chat, um, so the links are all in there. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> all right. Do we, right. we have questions? Just... Amy, this Hi. is Lori. Hi, Lori. I have a question on how often have you run into you do a blood draw and your the bird dies i've had I've two had... young birds in the last couple of years who have both died one had a heart attack and one had a stroke i'm very sorry Lori. i'm really sorry to hear and that i will not do, do any more any more blood work blood work Okay. Um, so um, to answer your first question, how many times have I ever had that happen? Um, the answer is never. I've never had it happen that we have drawn blood from um, any type of uh, parrot or any creature for that matter and that they have died during that process. Um, I think primarily that is because of the way that we handle our exams. Um, but also, like I mentioned in the beginning of, of the lecture, is, is that it's not necessarily that process of the actual blood draw. So it's not that that needle going into the vein and pulling the blood, that's not what's getting to them. It's like you said, it's the stress and the exacerbation that builds up. Um, and if the team doesn't know enough to say, hey, we have to back off and give this guy a little bit of a break, um, that's what could ultimately lead to a disastrous type of situation, which it sounds like kind of what you're describing here in this particular situation. So really understanding um, the signs um, and the body language and the posture of this of these of these patients when we're handling them in particular for diagnostics is crucial um, in the outcome of of that whole process. So if we see that a bird is getting too stressed out for a blood draw, we're not going to do it. That's just the end of the story because at the end of the day, we want an alive bird, not you know a blood yeah. sample with no bird to speak on. Um, so you know it's really just changing our approach as a veterinary team in general across across the board, it's changing our approach and, and how we handle these types of situations. And I'm very sorry for your losses. Well, thank you. Both birds did not seem to be stressed. It's, it, it can be an underlining for... condition, you know, it's, it could be an underlying, and, and, and they also exhibit their stress responses in a different, in a different manner. They, they, you know, some birds, they actually look panicked while others may, may not, and they may just might get silent. Panicked, yeah. And these were wellness blood work, you know, wellness exams with routine blood work. Yeah, no, that's no, terrible. We, I'm really sorry to hear that. I mean, we did do I mean, we did crop, do seeds, seeds. crop seeds. So there were, so issues, there were issues. But the but birds the bird probably, probably wouldn't have wouldn't died, have died this, this as soon. As soon. Right. So. Yeah, it's definitely a stressful situation um, if they're already stressed out for sure. So. There's so many messages in the chat. I'm just trying to read through that. They're coming fast and furious. 
Uh, Obani says, also recommend with carriers to have the bird do 10 step two, so carriers not always forget this. It, that's very good. Oops. Okay. Uh, Dwayne says, keep vet wrap, quick cloths, plant gato and gabapentin, natural anti-inflammatories, you know, things you can do to stable, stabilize your bird. So yeah, and you know, anything you can learn yourself about what to do um, to try to stabilize your bird. And plus, you know, you know your bird better than anyone else. So you know when they're acting differently. You know, you might take the bird somewhere and they're like, bird looks fine, but you know if they're different and whether or not they should be seen. Let's see. I, I have a question, um, Jasmine. Um, hindsight's twenty twenty. I know that's not a whole lot. Um, my uh, 24 and a half year old teal was a, um, for lack of a better word, COVID death. Um, I gave the carrier um, his, um, his vocalizations were raspy in nature. Um, I handed his carrier to the tech um, in the parking lot and was told that if something went wrong, they would come get me. And 10 minutes later, he was dead, um, having not been able to go in. Um, so um, I was told he died of congestive heart failure and they tried CPR and what have you. But I guess my question is, um, you're not the first time I'm hearing the words that don't touch the sick bird in that moment provide them life support and then when they're better um i i guess my question you weren't there i know that but when a bird is at that point of their i was told the raspiness of his vocalization was basically that he was filling with fluid um if they had left him alone in that moment, is it possible he could have survived or he was really like, no matter what they did? Um, I, I, I know you weren't there, but I'm just wondering when the bird is that sick, um, can anything be done? Or basically at that point, um, you have to handle them in order to save their life. Again, I'm really sorry for your loss. Um, in those particular types of situations, and again, like you said, I was not there, so I don't know the full uh, story that took place inside of the clinic. Um, but in that particular situation where CPR is um, is required and oxygen and things like of that nature, um, you do have to start the CPR process at that point in time. So um, just placing us into, even if we had placed us into an incubator on 100% oxygen, we kind of would have just been watching the outcome versus being hands-on and actually trying to prevent it from progressing into the direction of that. Yes, yes. So, so I wasn't clear that your that your was, like, was like, like a, a cat carrier, um, and it had it had a little opening on the top. It was a wire mesh. The, the carrier opened up like that. Um, but it had a wire across the top and it had this door and I kept it closed with a little cat leash because he had once opened it and <laughs> was uh, in the car sitting on top of his carrier. Um, but um, when I did go in, um, it was disconnected. So they had tried to get him through. I, I mean, I just hope that you know, he, he died instantly and that, but I was just wondering, like, had they opened up the carrier or, or whatever, whether or not his, you know, it's just, you, you're the first person I'm hearing talk about fear free and all that stuff. And I'm, I've always wondered all this time, whether or not if they hadn't opened his carrier the way they did whether he may have survived that emergency. 
and the what if the what ifs are are always always going to haunt us you know it's 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 one of those things and as much as it haunts um the owners it haunts us too as the veterinary team like what if we would have left them in the carrier what if we would have brought them out sooner what if what if what if um and they're and they're such extraordinary creatures like i explained with their respiratory and their air sacs and you know and all of that stuff it's very difficult where we're with a dog you know you you place an e-tube you start CPR right away. You start us on oxygen. Boom, boom, boom. Um, ideally, the step should be the same for a bird. But now you're, you know, you're. They have beaks. They're chomping down on those e tubes. What if they swallow that e tube? And now we have a foreign body on top of a respiratory distress situation. So it's like all this critical thinking, but it all has to happen within a very, very short amount of time. So um, you know, I. I I, I, I understand where you're coming from and I can hear you're hurt and I'm really sorry. I'm really, really sorry. My guess, and, and this is me having faith in the veterinary profession in general, is, is that if this is a place that knows birds and has seen birds and knows what to look for, that they did the absolute best and in and that, and, and that moment that they could have and that, um, you know, they, they really did try to save your baby. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thank you. You're welcome. The covid period when we couldn't go into the vets, I think was the hardest for all of us because ha first of all, not being able to be there with him, not seeing what's going on was just terrifying. And I had several emergency visits during that period as well. And it was seeing there in the car is just like the hardest thing you can do. But second, because you're not in the room, assuming it's a bird that's bonded to you, they're also more frightened than they would be because you're not there with them. So it was just you know, doubly bad from, from all standpoints, but, the, you know, that's that's all that could be done. But it, it was a very scary period to... I uh, I refused after that. I mean, it was, it was about six months when I brought Gabriel home. But um, even when I brought Gabriel home, I would not go to a vet where I had a park, where I had to, and this was January of 2021. So we were still in COVID but I would not go to a vet where I had to be in the parking lot. Um, it, it, it just, it just, it wasn't, that's here we heard that. it wasn't, there was no way you could have gone to, you know, here in Connecticut that wouldn't have done that. So it was. Uh, yeah, we're all very grateful that that point of time is, has passed and that we are able to go back to doing things the way that they should be done. And, you know, and I, and the at home visits definitely do help. Um, so, you know, again, I, I'm really excited at looking at the progression of getting this licensing done in Connecticut so that we can definitely help out and, you know, show, share our experiences and our ways of doing things with you guys. I think it would be a huge difference. I think so, too. Um, I see Melissa has her hand up. Hi, thanks. I have a question about medication administration. So, um, my bird has taken meds at various points points in time for different things. Um, right now he's on like two heart meds and um, like recently started this pattern of like regurgitating, vomiting up his meds like right afterwards. Is that, and it, I know it, it could be due to various reasons, but is that in your experience more like a sign of like of incorrect administration stress or any thoughts so it'd be on, very, on that yeah it'd be very difficult um for you to really do kind of like an um an incorrect administration because you're you're just giving it orally um so just into the beak i'm assuming um we're not going into our you know into our trachea or into our larynx or anything like that so i believe that it's um either something that we need to do we need to definitely check on the progression um of the heart of the heart condition so that's something that you should talk to your vet about and explain to them that these are new symptoms that you're exhibiting and just that we want to double check and make sure that nothing has progressed from where we started until now um and and if it hasn't then we might have um we might be dealing with a behavior um situation where we're just we're not responding to the actual process of giving the medications anymore and because we cannot control when it comes and when it goes we can just throw it up um that's kind of you know their way of saying well i can control this part portion of the situation by not taking your medication and throwing it right back up but first and foremost just because you did mention a heart condition i would double check with your vet that nothing has progressed yeah, yeah. understood all right do we have any more questions i know we, we had an enormous chat and i'll 
uh, summarize everything once once this is all done. And uh, but um, I just want to see if there are any more questions before I turn off the recording. Um, this is Melissa in New York again. Um, for regarding like, um, and I haven't had to do this, but um, regarding like a at home kind of hospital type setup, do you have any tips for um, birds who do not go in cages, who are, who are kind of used to, um, you know, being like they sleep on platforms, like outside of their cages, they don't go to, into their cages to sleep. Any tips on it's making on things more stress-free if you have to put them in a kind of in-cage hospital set up for set a few days? Yeah, I think that's where really the, you know, the the training of just kind of getting that carrier near us um, and, and just getting us sensitive to or to desensitized to that to that aspect of things so that that way, um, if we are able to move them into it, um, just to provide some, you know, some some stress, uh, a less stress, um, we would definitely want to try to get the dowel training in place. And we would also want to try to get the positive reinforcement and uh, and when it comes to terms to the carrier itself. Um, but if we are content being on flat platforms and we're not climbing up and down, if we can bring all of our resources to that flat path, uh, flat platform, it might be more beneficial for us to create kind of like a hospital setting within that one area rather than changing everything altogether because that might be just a little bit too stressful for what it sounds like your setup is for that for your bird. Um, so if you want to, um, you can, you can, uh, my email is in here. If you wanted to um, set something up where you can send me some pictures and stuff, I could definitely shoot out some better ideas um, if I have like a visual of what you're talking about for sure. Thanks. I appreciate, Thanks. It. I appreciate it. Of course. Oh, and it, it, it mentioned, mentioned it. it's also available uh, for hire for, um, I, I guess you kind of mentioned it, but you, you can hire her to do bird behavior training, hospital training, all those kinds of things at home over Zoom. You can just email her and um, you can set those up. Her price is very reasonable uh, compared to a lot of other bird behaviors around, I saw. Oh, they want your email in the chat one more time, Jasmine. And um, yeah, so uh, you can all see Jasmine has a lot of uh, great ideas about stuff. And um, I think we're all, uh, this was a great talk. I think everybody enjoyed it. There are a lot of comments in the, the chat, Jasmine, you can look at about how good the talk was, but I think everyone learned uh, a lot from this. And um, um, especially about that we, we now have a new resource uh, in Massachusetts that we weren't aware of before. So um, if there are no further questions. <laughs> Hi, this is, uh, this is Rod. I was wondering if I could just make uh, one comment. Absolutely. So first of all, I want to thank Jasmine. That was a really, really good talk. I thank everybody for showing up and I appreciate everybody uh, interacting because a lot of times we have these talks and it's, us talking and nobody says anything. So this was nice. Um, I'm glad that Jasmine brought up Luna because that was, I know that I've been working and not to toot her horn too much, but I've been working with Jasmine for a while and she has done some pretty amazing things in our hospital with the birds uh, for anybody who's seen her in the hospital with the birds. Um, but Luna was really interesting to me because that was one of the few that I just didn't know how she was going to fit that in in a time crunch that she was given. And to see how fast that happened was remarkable, to say the least, uh, with a bird that was pretty traumatized by the whole situation. And the other thing I want to bring up is uh, that not only, you know, can Jasmine obviously help you with that fear-free part, but I think knowing the medical part is a massive uh, asset to the situation because some of these things are not strictly behavioral but do have a medical component and having somebody that can um, meld both of those things together can really give you uh, um, better insight uh, as to uh, how to proceed with uh, with the behavioral situations that you're trying to contend with. So I just want to bring that up that that's something that I think is huge that she can do she can see both parts of that equation um, and not just only the behavioral part. And I think that's a big deal when you're when you're trying to deal with birds because a lot of the things 
that are going on, they're hiding because they're prey species and their job is not to show those things. And so we might miss or misinterpret something as behavioral that is actually medical. That, that's an excellent point. And um, by the way, you might want to introduce yourself because there, there are probably a lot of people in here who don't know who you are. Hi, uh, I'm Rod. I'm uh, Jasmine's partner at RAM. Uh, and uh, we've been uh, trying for the last uh, several years since we've opened up to really um, improve uh, uh, our, our client's experience, uh, the hospital experience for exotics. Uh, and Jasmine's really taken to heart uh, um, the avian aspect and impressed upon me and everybody that we work with that there can be a very different uh, experience. Uh, I, being a very skeptical person, <laughs> did not think that this was going to be. I, I've been doing this for a while, and I was trained very old school. And seeing how our appointments go now compared to how my appointments used to go 15 years ago, it's a whole different animal. Like to see birds actually enjoying being in their appointments was something I never thought was feasible unless we were at a specialty facility that we had three hours to do one bird exam. Uh, so um, yeah, I, I'm I'm really happy that we're able to 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 train uh, this this method, uh, and that Jasmine's kind of bringing it uh, um, forward in our hospital, so that you know we can bring a better experience to everybody. And, and Rod, for those who don't know, is the veterinarian at Ram. So uh, some of you, I'm sure, know him. I know we have a bunch of people on here today who are. The clients at RAM, and which which says a lot for you that they wanted to come to this meeting, and uh, as opposed to writing writing nasty uh, nasty reviews online. So, oh, I recommend them to every anybody ever asks for a, a mobile vet, especially, but any veterinary care. I'm again, I'm like a over an hour, I think, away, and I've driven up to Pepperell. I've met them you know, to drop off a chicken for necropsy somewhere. Like I've, we've, they've come to my house. I, we've gone all over and genuinely they are two of the, and all the, the whole team too, because there are other techs, but like we've had some rough stuff. I, I, I had to say goodbye to my cat about a year ago. They're, everyone is so compassionate and wonderful. Um, and my, my cockatiel gem does not really like being held to the point that like, I've kind of had to try to treat some things at home. She, you know, if she's had a couple of, um, she had a, a recent unfortunate window incident. Um, and I just kind of don't, I don't want to bring her to an emergency. The emergency hospitals that we've been to around here don't usually have an avian vet on staff. Um, but when we've had her for regular appointments, I, st I can't, I still don't believe that you guys b drew blood from my, you know, like, but somewhere probably between 12 and 15 year old mystery rescue cockatiel who like doesn't does not want me to touch her most of the time she she likes scritchies she'll fly to me but she doesn't want to be touched and i said what do you mean you actually got blood because i i wanted you to do it but i didn't know if it would even work so um yeah i mean i i'm rambling but honestly like it has really been a lifesaver for me um, for multiple reasons between my dog that doesn't like other dogs who it makes it really hard for her to go to the vet at a traditional setting. Um, you know, when my cat was elderly and hated travel and my birds and my chickens, like they're just, they've been a lifesaver across my menagerie of a ton of species. So yeah, highly recommend. Highly recommend. Thank you, Val. Well, that's great to hear. So, um, I guess it's time to wrap it up. It's getting kind of late. I want to thank everyone for coming. I especially want to thank Jasmine for this fabulous talk. It was very interactive. We got a lot of people involved. Um, and uh, I will be posting the video once once it gets uh, uploaded. I'll let everyone know the link and I'll try to gather the information that was in the chat as well. But this was great um, to hear all this information. We look forward to, to seeing you again sometime and learning how you're progressing in Connecticut. And uh, just want to thank everyone uh, for coming to join us tonight. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. This is awesome. <laughs>